We have studied a number of things about the topic of prayer, the fact that we need to improve in our prayer life, the fact that our flesh offers many things that attempt to interrupt and derail our prayer life, the fact that um, Jesus in his sample prayer gives us some laser points to put into our prayer, uh, the glory of God, the gifts of God, uh, all of those different things that we studied there. The fact that uh, when we pray, we need to understand that God is always going to give us what is best, not necessarily what we request, but we have a conviction of faith that God has always given us what's best, and so we ask with that kind of anticipation and that kind of faith the last two weeks. We talked about praying scripture, how to accomplish that, and then last Sunday we actually prayed scripture and had four different guys that um, helped us accomplish that. So if you've missed any of those, let me... Uh, suggest that you hit our website and you can catch up on the, on the topics that we've looked at. Today I want to share with you some procedures of offering prayer. I want to cover two areas. The first one is posture in prayer and the second is types of prayer. Now let me just preface all of this with the only reason I want to mention posture in prayer is not because there's one posture that's right and one that isn't right, but posture represents something in prayer. And there are times when you will find that a particular mental request and a particular heart in prayer would be buttressed by a particular posture of prayer. And so that's the reason to throw these things out there. It isn't that, okay, we need to be standing, kneeling, laying down. It's, it's not that, that that's the issue. The issue is these postures represent things. And that is important for us to have. So let's talk about different postures. First of all, let's talk about standing. The very first example that I would uh, il use to illustrate this is Jesus himself. When he was transfigured before Peter, James, and John in Luke's account, it says, and as he was praying, and then we've got the description of how Moses and Elijah show up with him, and there's this glory, and there's this, uh, his face is shining, and then verse 32 says, Peter and those with him were in a deep sleep, and when they came fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who were standing with him. So we put that all together. Jesus was praying when all this happened, and when the disciples saw what was going on, everybody was standing up. So it's a pretty safe assumption that Jesus was on that occasion standing in prayer. We would also note the contrast that Jesus himself makes between the self-righteous Pharisee and the uh, tax collector who both are said to have been standing. The Pharisee stood and scripture says stood up and prayed about himself and he thanked God that he wasn't like the other sinners. We find the tax gatherer in verse 13 stood at a distance. Now Jesus is not here condemning standing and praying. The Pharisee is condemned because of how and what he was praying. The tax collector is in the same posture as is the Pharisee. Other occasions where we find people standing in prayer, Jehoshaphat prayed for the liberation of God's people and asked all the people to stand before the Lord in that prayer. Hannah was standing in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Job is mentioned as one who was standing in prayer in chapter 30 and verse 20. Now, standing was a posture of old which indicated that one had been given permission to speak before a king. In other words, this, this whole posture represents the right to come before royalty. So what we might assume in us standing to pray is that we are acknowledging God as a king, our king of the universe, and that we have a right to come before him. Again, not arrogance but we've been given the right to talk to the God of the universe. And so the next time when you're asking an assembly to stand to pray, you know what could enter your mind? I've been given the right to stand before the God of the universe. So standing is one posture. Another posture that is spoken of in scripture is kneeling. Obviously one of the first that will come to mind because we've been looking at Daniel in our Sunday evenings is that Daniel prayed three times a day kneeling. So Daniel assumes the posture of kneeling. When Stephen was being stoned in Acts chapter 7, 
it says that he knelt and that he prayed. He knelt down and cried out to the Lord, uh, cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Peter also is recorded to have knelt. When he came to the situation where he was going to resurrect Tabitha, it says that he sent everybody out of the room and then he knelt and prayed. Interesting. Not sure why he sent everybody out. Not sure why he knelt. But Peter knelt and then said, Tabitha, get up. And she opened up her eyes. Kneeling is a posture that expresses surrender, submission, humility. And so again, sometime in your prayer life, if you are seeking to demonstrate to yourself your humility, it may be a worthy posture to assume to kneel down. One author put it this way, and I love the way he said this. In kneeling, the worshiper goes voluntarily down to the dust from which they were created. We go voluntarily back to the dust, representing that surrender, that humility. Another posture we find spoken of in scripture is sitting. David engaged in sitting prayer in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 18. Then King David went in, sat in the Lord's presence, and said, Who am I, Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? David sits and talks with God. Especially in Jewish culture, sitting was a posture that represented an arena of learning or gaining knowledge. And so we will, we will find people sitting at the feet of. Paul references sitting at the feet of Gamaliel. We will find rabbis having people sit and them giving the meaning. We will even read of Jesus taking the scroll and opening it to Isaiah, a sitting in the synagogue, and he gives reference to the fact that Isaiah was speaking of him. Sitting was a posture representing learning or gaining understanding. Numerous occasions we find in scripture that that people sat before the prophets of God so that they could gain understanding. So as we think about this as a posture to use during prayer, perhaps mentally to recognize I am here sitting before God wanting to gain understanding from him. Sitting might bring that to mind and play into uh, the requests that we may make at a particular time. Another form of praying has to do with lying down. There are times when reflections and meditations are spoken of as happening during the night as people laid on their beds. We read this in Psalm 4.4, Be angry and do not sin. On your bed, reflect in your heart and be still. Okay? How about Psalm 63? When on my bed I think of you, I meditate on you during the night watches. So there is a, a time in which restfulness brings on a certain heart, and gives our prayers a certain definition as we are laid, resting, meditating in mind and heart. We would also find in 1 Kings chapter 1 and verse 47, the king's servants have also gone to congratulate our Lord King David, saying, may your God make the name of Solomon more famous than your name, and may he make his throne greater than your throne, than the king bowed in worship on his bed. So another example of, of this kind of prayerful attitude being expressed as one was laying in bed. Now, another form of lying down is also re recorded in Scripture as prostration, which basically meant that people laid face down with outstretched arms. It was a posture utilized to show submission before authority, paying homage to a superior, or begging for mercy from a king. There may be occasions in our lives where the, the nature of our prayer will be suited for this posture in prayer, laying out, face to the ground, arms outstretched before God. This, by the way, was the posture that Scripture says Jesus, Jesus assumed in the garden. And we recognize the heaviness that was in his heart. We recognize the struggle he was having, submitting to God's will, and so Jesus used a posture that was going to assist him in accomplishing that. And that's a powerful example for us as well. When we're finding difficulty with our pride, with, 
with uh, feelings of control and things that are at odds with our Christian desire, what a great time to say, it's time for me to prostrate myself and to pray that way. So there are four different, if you will, postures of prayer that the scripture references. Not that any of those, it would be very awkward in a public assembly for us to say, okay, let's all, let's all lay down and pray. Are there occasions in public assembly when it would be proper for us to kneel? Absolutely. One of the postures of standing in prayer is this. It has nothing to do with arrogance. It has to do with receiving gifts from God. And so there are times when that might be an appropriate posture for us to pray in. And may even be what Paul references when he writes to Timothy and says, I want men everywhere to raise holy hands in prayer. I want to talk about some types of prayer. And the reason I want to share these is because, you know, Scripture tells us to pray constantly. I think if we understand some of the nature of the prayers we can offer, the types of prayers that are, are available to us, we will find that not difficult to do at all. And so some of these you may be familiar with, some of them you may have never thought of, never heard of, as uh, are true with me. And some of them are just names that are put to things you've probably already done. For example, someone coined the phrase, and who did it is kind of lost in history, but it happened in the early 19th, 19th century. Someone coined the phrase arrow prayers. Arrow prayers. Now, the original idea and the meaning behind this is it, it, it's the allusion to the speed at which an arrow can be notched and shot. And this gal is really firing these things off, and there is a target there, by the way, that she's hitting. Arrow prayers are the kind of prayers that we can make specifically without interrupting what we're doing. They can be notched and shot so quickly that we can continue with what we're doing. For example, Nehemiah was the great instigator of the rebuilding of Jerusalem. One of the things we know about him is he has visitors come from Jerusalem. He asks them about the condition of the city. They tell him it's in ruins. And the scripture lets us know in, in Nehemiah 1, 4 through 11, Nehemiah began to pray about this. And he fasted about this. And if we look at the, the, the Hebrew uh, months are mentioned in there, and if we look at those and, and figure that out, he's doing this for four months. For four months, Nehemiah is praying and fasting over the condition of the city of Jerusalem. So what we find is that he mourned for days. We find that he turned sadness into supplication and fasting. We find that he exalted God. We find that he confessed corruptions, his own, and those of his people, he says, we have sinned, my people and I have sinned. He, he, he repents of those things, and he asks God to hear and to forgive that there are those who still wish to serve in obedience. Nehemiah was a man of prayer, right? No question. I mean, when you can take on something and pray something for four months, and it includes that kind of devotion and that kind of soundness, we have no, no doubt that Nehemiah was a man of prayer. His first exercise of prayer obviously interrupted his life. That's what fasting is. That's the purpose of fasting, actually, is to interrupt our life. But this mighty man of prayer also knew how to give arrow prayers. <laughs> and it, it's fascinating to me that Scripture gives us an account of, of this man over this same situation offering different kinds of prayers. Here's what we find in Nehemiah chapter 2. The king said to me, why are you sad? You're not sick. This is nothing but sadness of heart. I was overwhelmed with fear, and I replied to the king, May the king live forever. Why should I not be sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king asked me, What is your request? Ding! Prayed to the God of heaven. And I answered the king. The king asked the question, Nehemiah, you know what? I just need to go pray about this for a minute. And I'll be back. Give me 30 minutes and I'll be back. No. I mean, he does, the, he does the fastest arrow prayer that we find recorded in Scripture. The king asks a question. Nehemiah, whoa, what should I do, God? And then he says to the king, if it pleases the king. And he puts it out there and all of a sudden he has permission. He has materials. He has people. And the wall around Jerusalem is going to get rebuilt. Man of prayer but he used arrow prayers. 
Arrow prayers are tailored for life events. You don't have to stop everything. You can shoot off an arrow prayer at any time. They are short. You don't have to overthink it. You don't have to ponder how you're going to word this. Something enters your life, a situation happens, wham, you shoot off an arrow. They can be offered in times of emergency, times of thanksgiving, times of temptation, times of needing extra wisdom, times of intercession and strength. Arrow prayers are fit for life situations. So when Paul says to the Thessalonians, pray constantly, this is some of what he's talking about. Just have, have your arrows ready. Be ready to pray constantly. Another kind of prayer, type of prayer, is called flash prayers. So named because they are prayers that are formulated by flashing a picture of what is around you. And then you take that and you pray regarding what you see in the face of other people, what you hear in their voices, or what you might witness in their actions. I need to tell you that, that, that I had never put a word to this before, but years ago, we moved, we moved to Lincoln from a small town in eastern Montana. We heard sirens there, you know, once in a while. We were three blocks from the hospital. The, you know, I mean, once in a while, we'd hear sirens. We moved to Lincoln, lived in the White House for seven years. The fire station's right down here, two blocks away. You know one of the hardest things for us to get used to? Coming down Vine Street, down 56th Street, just sirens all the time, all the time. Becky made a comment one night, and she said, somebody's life's in turmoil. I don't think I've heard a siren since then that I've not asked God to bring peace to the people that are in turmoil. I don't have to turn off the radio, and I don't have to shut down the computer. I hear a siren. I said, God, help those people. Help them find you. A siren does that to me automatically. Flash praying. Flash praying. He told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not become discouraged. Pray constantly. That, to me, again, this is just another tool that aids us in accomplishing that task. You know where flash prayers can be offered? In a church auditorium. This, this is, I, I read this uh, and a gentleman that was describing his own use of flash prayer. <clears throat> he said he, he came in to services late, sat in the back row, which is reserved for latecomers, by the way. He, he sat in the, the back row. And he said he began to look at the back of people's heads. And he said it caused him to think about certain things in those people's lives. He said the preacher got up to preach, and he said it was an Oham sermon. And so he said, I began to pray for the back of those heads. I don't know this guy, so I don't know if he's stretching it, but here's what he said. As he prayed, the person he was praying for either turned around, messed with their collar, touched their hair, and he said every person he prayed for did that. Flash prayers. You see a look in someone's eye. In hospitals, flash prayers. In the mall, some of you like to sit in the mall and just watch people, right? What a great occasion for flash praying. During emergency situations. Okay, here's, here's my, own, my own true story. I do know this one's right. The other day I was coming home for lunch. Text back said, what do you want? We decide we're going to have Panera chicken soup. I pull into Panera. They're in the process of moving. There is no Panera on 66th Street. It's closed. So boom, roadblock. So then I get the brilliant idea. The Chinese spot across the, the way has hot sour soup. I'll get hot sour soup. So I pull in there, and you can hardly ever find a parking place. I finally found a parking place, and I start walking in, get my soup. I come walking out, and there's a gentleman. He has his hospital bracelet on. He's walking with a cane. <clears throat> there is a, a rubber band around his arm where, obviously, they have just taken blood from him. He, he's a younger gentleman, and he's walking with a cane. 
And I did a flash prayer. And he looked up at me and smiled. Took his eyes off the icy road and looked at me and smiled. Just think what can happen to us if we start flash praying. Think of the connectivity that we may have with people that we didn't have before. Opportunities that we may gain that we didn't have before. This is a fantastic type of prayer. So we've got arrow prayers. We've got flash prayers. Here's another great one. It's called breath prayers. They differ from arrow prayers in that an arrow prayer can originate from an outside situation. Something's happening. Boom, I shoot off an arrow. A breath prayer is what's happening in here. It's something that's stirring inside of me. And so I decide I'm going to make a breath prayer, seeking to claim the calm of a particular spiritual truth. There are many suggestions that people offer in regards to breath prayer. Here, here, here are some. One is to breathe in as you pray a Bible phrase. The reason to breathe in is because when you speak, you always breathe out. So if in prayer you are concentrating on breathing in with words in your mind, it's opposite of what you always do. So it gets your attention differently. See, it's not normal. So it's a good thing from that perspective. Some suggest breathe in the first half, breathe out the second half. Some suggest breathe in the first half, hold your breath, meditate on that first half, then breathe out the second half. If I have you totally confused, some examples will help solve it. Try this. Breathe it in. Let's meditate. Breathe it out. Jesus, son of David. And there's so many phrases like that in scripture that can become breath prayers to bring us calm in times of trial. In God I trust, I will not be afraid. Forgive my sin, for it is great. The words of John the Baptist, he must increase, I must decrease. The life I live, I live in faith. Not my will, but yours be done. Breath prayers. Lastly, one word prayers. You know, back when we began to study prayer, we had a special Sunday night where we prayed, and that was the gist of our, of our Sunday night gathering. We had different types of prayers that we engaged in, and one of those that night was to share a single word prayer. And as the men did that, we were given the liberty of doing it more than once, but you could only do one word at a time. And I have to tell you, that was the most impacting part of that evening for me. When you have to take and focus to a single word what's in your heart, you get what is real and significant. We are people of language, and most of us at some level enjoy talking, some more than others. <laughs> but as I thought about reducing our prayers to one word, I thought about these cooks you watch, you know, and they, they've cooked this marvelous chicken, blah, 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 and they take their pan, the chicken's out, and now they've got this pan, and they say, now we're going to make the sauce. And so they dump some cream or something in there, and they start getting all the gritty parts off the bottom of the pan and they start stirring that and then they say now we're going to let this reduce going to have a reductive sauce and by the time it's done the flavor has intensified the taste is enormous and you know they, they've started with this half a pan full of stuff and they end up with two tablespoons and they go drizzle, drizzle on top of that chicken. And man, it looks delicious. That's what happens in one word prayer. 
We take that which is wonderful and we reduce it down until what we have is exquisite condensation of thoughts. Think of opportunities when these words would express the totality of what you need to pray. Holy. God. Help. Forgive. Jesus. Thanks. Yes. Trust, hope, love. You, endless. Endless number of word prayers. So we've talked about four different types of prayers. Aerial prayers, flash prayers, breath prayers, and one word prayers. There are no assigned postures or methods or types when it comes to praying. What we have shared here today is only meant to inspire you to find a more effective and improved way to communicate with your God. And there are times when posture can assist that. There are times when the type of prayers we offer can bring us to a new level of communication. I hope that some of these things are motivating you in your prayer life. Remind you, we still have the prayer board up there for you to put prayer requests. There is still a sample sheet of praying scripture back there if that's something you want to pursue. Uh, there also are additional uh, pocket prayer envelopes and uh, replacement cards if you need to do that. Becoming people who pray more. You know, one of, the, one of the quotes that I haven't shared yet, prayer is not an important Christian work. It is the work. Think about that one for a while. Is there a single area of our Christian service where prayer doesn't need to precede the work? Teaching, evangelism, worship. Is there anything but what prayer doesn't supersede the work itself? Prayer is the work. It's important for us to be people of prayer.